Robotics for Stroke Rehabilitation. Stroke is the leading cause of long-term disability. There are 7 million stroke survivors in the United States. And 50% of these individuals have hemiplegia. So what is hemiplegia? Hemiplegia is one-sided weakness or the inability to move one side of your body. How does that affect the ability to walk? 30% of these individuals are unable to walk with them without some sort of assistance. So what does stroke gait recovery, or the ability to recover function of walking, look like in the rehabilitation process? First, we start in the inpatient setting with gait retraining, or walking retraining. We want to get you up and walking as fast as we can to help you recover function. We have gait with compensation strategies. What that means is you get up and you're walking, but you're not walking in the same healthy way you used to. You may be asymmetrical. You may not be balanced. You may not take the same step on each side. You then wind up with what we call a pathological gait. Those are those compensations to help you successfully ambulate. We usually get to a phase of the assisted utilization of assistive devices. Canes, walkers, wheelchairs, ankle foot orthotics, braces, things to help you successfully ambulate. The goal is to get to independent ambulation, healthy gait, and an efficient gait. But oftentimes, we don't get there. We stay in a phase of pathological compensations and utilization of assistive devices. So what does this mean? Scientifically, this is what I'm studying. But to the person who's had a stroke, this means they have limitations in the access to goods and services in the community. It means that when they go to the grocery store, they may not be able to go down every aisle. They may have to choose where they go, or even have order, groceries ordered in, or have people to help them bring goods and services to their home. It means that if they have compensation devices, they have to consider, am I going over grass, carpet, curbs, ramps, uneven surfaces? Is my family going to the beach? What kind of surfaces am I going to encounter with all of those devices I need to successfully ambulate? Will I be able to go? Will, be I, will I be able to fully participate? Can I get those devices up a flight of stairs? These are all the considerations and why staying in this phase of rehabilitation is such a problem. What we want is potentially to skip this phase or transition through this phase to get to independent ambulation, healthy gait, and an efficient gait, which means you have access to all the goods and services in the community and you can do all the things that you want to do. So how are we going to do this? So in the last two years, we've been looking at rehabilitation robotics to help with the assistance of walking, to help you assist with walking in the rehabilitation setting. So these are some of the robots that are available today. Commercial manufacturers, some of these came out of an academic setting and then became commercial manufacturers. And there are a few different robots available. Some of them are FDA approved, some of them are in concept, and even today, more are being manufactured. The important thing to think about in rehabilitation robotics, especially for gait retraining, is that you're trying to promote recovery of function, recovery of walking function. So you want return of movement and function through these devices. They guide the patient through repeated movements. So the idea is that each one of these have slightly different characteristics, but you need to pair the device to the patient. So before you even decide if this is an option for a patient, before you even decide if you should consider using an exoskeleton for a patient, for me, I'm using it in the inpatient setting for stroke rehabilitation. The first thing a clinician needs to do is consider what is the patient diagnosis? Should I use an exoskeleton to help someone learn how to walk again? What is their diagnosis? What are their rehabilitation goals? How do I pair those rehabilitation goals with their diagnosis in the inpatient setting? we're considering how we can apply exoskeletons to stroke rehabilitation to help a patient get up and walking and moving. So we're using it to facilitate recovery. These devices have also been used for personal mobility. Are you using these devices to facilitate recovery, like we are? Or are you using them as a personal mobility device? Is this something that you're going to now ambulate with in the community for the rest of your life? Ambulate with in the home? Will this help you achieve successful ambulation? Is it for the secondary benefits? There are many benefits of standing. There are many benefits of standing up and not being in a seated position. For bowel, bladder, sexual function, there are many things that are helpful for standing to load your bones, to load your muscles, to give you an upright posture. It's a healthy treatment. So these secondary benefits of standing in conjunction with gait retraining may be your goal. And lastly, are you using it in the home or the clinical setting? So again, we've talked a little bit about surfaces. 
Are you using it on a flat linoleum floor in a hospital setting? Or do you need to take it home, where it needs to go upstairs, walk on different surfaces, walk outside in the community, and navigate across the street? These are the considerations that you need to take before you decide to use an exoskeleton. So many of you may have seen some of these devices. You've probably all seen Iron Man. It's slightly different. The goal for this, for me, is stroke rehabilitation, is gait retraining. I want to help someone learn how to walk again. So if any of you came in today and you were able to successfully and independently ambulate, you probably don't think much about it. But if you come to my lab, we know who's coming down the hall by the cadence with which they walk, how hard they pound the floor. I walk very fast, and I pound the floor very hard. It's very bad for my height. But as you guys walk around, I see the way you walk. I'm looking at how symmetrical you are, how balanced you are. I'm looking at how you shift your weight. I'm looking at each step. You take a step, each of us, every time we take a step, we don't fall over because we take a next step. That's the process of walking in its most simplest form. You don't fall over, you stick out that next limb. You shift your weight, you offload the back foot, and you take a step. In its most simplest form, that's walking. In the rehabilitation environment, we have one side that's paralyzed or weak, and you need to load that impaired limb. How do you successfully ambulate? How do we retrain you to successfully walk so you can access goods and services in the community, so you can participate with your grandchildren, or so you can go out on a date and go to the movies, so that you can fully participate in the community by walking? So if you don't know what a robotic exoskeleton is, it's this wearable suit. It's got a backpack, typically, or some sort of a fixation to the upper limb. It provides overground gait training, or that reciprocal, balanced stepping. It's initiated by weight shift. Shifting your weight and taking that next step, offloading the back limb and taking that next step. If you can tell, I really dissect walking. So as you walk around, I'm going to be watching you walking. Biofeedback. So in the world of neuroplasticity, where the brain has just been damaged by a stroke, and you want that brain to heal and relearn, it's important that the device gives you some sort of feedback, but you're walking with the device. The device is not walking you. You want to relearn and retrain, not go for a ride. So the device cues you, when have I met a lateral target? When have I met an anterior target? When have I offloaded that back limb to take that next step? These are all really important phases of relearning the ability to walk. It's battery powered, so you're not tethered, so you do have the ability to go out and walk where you need to go under the power of batteries without it being tethered. And the last part, which for what I'm doing is the most important, it's under the supervision of a physical therapist. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to pair the patient with the rehabilitation strategies and the clinical team that can help them regain function. So we want the physical therapist to take all their knowledge and how they retrain gait in the clinical setting, in the inpatient setting, for a patient with stroke with one-sided weakness who can't independently load each limb. And instead of giving them many different compensation strategies, like canes and walkers, to help them ambulate, we want to help them relearn the ability to independently ambulate so they can be independent with quality and efficient gait in the community. So the goals in the rehabilitation setting, while we're retraining gait, are intensive step dosage to learn those step patterns. So you learn how to shift weight. So now you all remember, when you take a step, you shift your weight, you load that limb. You shift your weight, you offload, you take a step. Your muscles are firing to help you load that limb. There are phases of gait where two feet are on the ground and phases of gait where one foot is on the ground. This is walking, double support, single support. It gets much more complicated. And these are all the phases that we have to retrain. Can you imagine? You have one-sided weakness, and you have to stand on that one side and balance. It's difficult for me to do right now, and you're doing it dynamically. So we want to retrain the ability to load and balance on that limb in a dynamic setting, taking each step. And the important part of these exoskeletons is we can customize them to patient impairment level. So depending on the level of impairment of that limb, we can change the level of assistance. Currently, we're using the Exobionics ExoGT. So I showed you a number of different robots. And the one that we've selected for stroke rehabilitation to use right now and to research and investigate how this device can be paired with a stroke inpatient and return function 
The reason that we're using this device is it has the ability to power the limbs independently. So we have that one-sided weakness. We can provide assistance to that limb through the robot, or we can remove assistance as function returns. And for the healthy limb, we can do the same. We can remove or add or take away assistance as needed. And why is that important? We're trying to retrain and relearn the ability to walk. Again, we're not going for a ride. We're trying to retrain intensively with many steps how to relearn the ability to walk. So if you've never seen it, this is stroke inpatient gait training. This is a patient who's relatively impaired. He's in the inpatient setting. He's just had a stroke. And they're retraining walking in the clinical setting. This is not research. This is how gait retraining is done for an impaired individual to relearn the ability to walk. So what you see is the therapist on a rolling stool. You see he's supported on a bedside table to keep an upright posture. You see she's flexing the knee and advancing the limb through in order to help him take that next step. What you notice in the beginning of the video is his trunk comes forward and she has to push it back. So he has what we call a little bit of a destabilizing event. He starts to fall over because that's how we take a step. We lean forward and we take a step. Unfortunately, he's lacking control on that one side. He's got weakness on that one side. But if you look at the way that this environment is, his foot is ace wrapped to help keep it off the floor, to keep his foot lifted because he has difficulty lifting his foot, controlling his foot as he goes through. He's supported on a bedside table and he has difficulty using his arm on the right side. In contrast, this is the same patient in a robotic exoskeleton performing gait retraining in the clinical environment. The difference is in the planes of movement. You see he's constrained into the sagittal plane, able to take those steps in the sagittal plane, able to take those steps through in the sagittal plane. The steps are somewhat more symmetrical. Instead of getting a step two gait, we get a step through gait, which is very important. We want to retrain symmetrical loading. He's sequencing with a cane. They're teaching him how to sequence with a cane. So again, he's still going through that gait continuum where he learns with some compensation strategies and he learns with some assistive devices. But if we can get intensive dosing in a quality gait training environment, could we get someone to an efficient gait and full recovery. That's our goal. So the important thing is this is not physical therapist guided gait training versus robotic gait training. That's not what I'm trying to present. Robots are a tool in the rehabilitation process. And many of you have seen these robots maybe in commercials or in television shows where someone's in a seated position and they're able to stand and rise into an exoskeleton and walk around. That's a very powerful message, to be able to stand and walk. But in this environment, what we're trying to do is maximize that dosing of gait recovery, maximize that walking. We want more steps, more quality steps. We want to retrain quality walking and quality gait to help maximize recovery. So what we want to do is pair the physical therapist with the technology to provide the best outcomes. So my background is in biomechanics, and typically we take these patients and we want a comprehensive analysis of how they're walking. So this is a patient in the robotic exoskeleton in the gait lab. And what I've done is I've stripped away the clothes and the skin, so all you see are a rigid reconstruction of the human body. And if you've ever seen a gait analysis or a biomechanics laboratory, you see how we can turn the person in many different planes. We can look at the frontal plane, the sagittal plane, the transverse plane. We can look at rotations, flexion and extension. And it's important so we understand how the movements are happening. So what you're looking at at the bottom of the screen is muscle activation. What we want to see in the exoskeleton is phasic muscle activation. Again, not going for a ride. What you're seeing is the tibialis anterior. So that's the muscle that's going to lift the foot. So it's important to lift that foot as you swing it through. So what we're seeing in the exoskeleton is we're seeing contraction, muscle activation of that tibialis anterior to lift the foot as they're walking. What you also see from the side view is some knee flexion. You see the person flexing their knee and bringing it through. We need that to clear the floor as we bring our foot through during walking. What you can see from the frontal plane is the weight shifts. You can see the shoulders as the person shifts from side to side. He's sequencing with a cane. His arm is supported. 
And what we're looking at is quality gait retraining in a constrained environment where the exoskeleton can power the limbs when the person is not able to power themselves to help facilitate that walking. This is standard of care gait training, the same environment that I showed you before, but now we're looking at it from a biomechanics perspective. The first thing you notice is a decreased knee flexion from that sagittal plane. You're not getting as much knee flexion, so you're retraining a gait pattern that maybe isn't as optimal as you would expect or as you would hope. So you're retraining a gait pattern that's not as much knee flexion, and the system is somewhat vaulting over their body to clear that limb and get it through. They're still sequencing with a cane, and in this particular patient, they have good upright trunk control. If you look from that frontal view, you don't see the same weight shifts that you would expect. And the planes of movement, you can see the foot is externally rotated and pointing out. And you're not getting as much knee flexion as the foot transitions through. The reason we look at these biomechanics and we look at the biomechanics of the movement is to really understand comprehensively how the muscles are firing, how the bones are loading, and how we're retraining gait in this environment versus a physical therapist environment. And what I'm researching is to understand who responds to robotic therapy and who responds to physical therapist guided tra gait training and how can we combine them or select the optimal environment for gait retraining in the inpatient setting to help recover function for the patient who we want to return to quality of life and return to participation in the community. The important message of today is that in order to really comprehensively look at this, we need to take the engineers making the robots, the clinicians who are applying this technology, and the patients who are using this technology, along with the researchers, to really comprehensively understand how this technology can be most effectively applied. We have had over 80 patients in this device over the last two years successfully ambulate in the inpatient setting. The patients were able to use the device. We were able to match the device to the patient to help them get efficient steps, increased dosing. And for each of these patients, we saw more dosing, more step dosing. In the first two weeks since their stroke, they were able to walk about eight feet with the physical therapist, with physical therapist guided gait. In the robotic exoskeleton, in their first exposure to the exoskeleton, they were able to walk over 300 feet with two weeks of entering the inpatient setting. So it's that increased dosing that we're looking for to help regain function of walking. We don't know yet how to optimally apply this technology. And I look forward to researching this further and coming back with more results sometime soon. Thank you.